Thanks very much, Terry. Um, I'll follow on uh, particularly about evidence of um, land use changes on catchments um, that are part of the Great Barrier Reef, work we've been doing for some decades or about a decade. Um, and I'll briefly mention, I'll just correct Terry on one minor point in my talk about uh, the involvement of the Royal Society. Um, different. <laughs> Here we go. This is a, I'm not going to talk about the impact of CO2, um, but it, my view is that um, this, is, this phenomena of increasing atmospheric CO2 is uh, inevitable now. Um, and what I show on the right is on, on, on your right is the, the gradient of increase of CO2. So from about 1970, it was increasing at one, pp, one ppm per year. Now we're going up about twice the rate of two ppm per year. So we can predict, um, based on that simple observation, that um, in the next 20 years we'll be probably doubled uh, PCO2. So there's, you'll hear a lot of talks about this impact. And, and unfortunately, I think this is a reality. But what can we do with respect to coral reefs? Well, of course we have global impacts from the climate change and, and they're, as I said, um, in progress and difficult, I think, to, to prevent to some extent, although we obviously I'll, we have to do something. But I think the issue I want to talk about now is the local impacts because they're the other half of the equation and obviously if we can keep the reefs um, in some uh, state of high optimum resilience, they're, they're uh, future prospects in face of these other threats is at least somewhat better. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk now about this history of the river runoff and the Great Barrier Reef is a unique system with very large river catchments that border it. Many of these catchments are actually in very desolate areas. They have a, a semi-desert, um, the larger catchments in particular the Burdekin and the Fitzroy and, and, and there's been a lot of uh, land use uh, and, and more intensive agriculture and so on. Uh, the main precipitation occurs very episodically. This shows some of the floods um, from the period in, in, the, in the 70s. We had some very major cyclones and also 91. And I think more recently in 208, which I haven't updated that slide. But it's a very episodic flood events and you can get uh, river levels up to 25 metres. And when it does, the bridge, this classic bridge, often gets flooded with huge volumes of water going out. And I'll just show you briefly, well, I'm sure many of you have seen, this is the Ames um, um, model of what happened in 74 with the freshwater plumes heading across into the reef. Um, so there's definitely evidence for major um, uh, transfer of sedimentary material from the land onto the reef. And you can see it visually by the colour. These boundaries are often very sharp. And, and there's, so this is something that's been observed. And the question is, is this part of the natural uh, phenomenon that's always happened on the Great Barrier Reef or are we looking at something different? And to investigate this question, um, uh, we looked at, we, we had access and worked closely with Ames actually, who had, um, who had done the excellent job of uh, looking at the, 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 um, the flood events that you could see in the luminescent bands. So Peter Isdale had started that with Dave Barnes. So you could, actually, we could, you could actually see these flood events and we thought, well, you know, I wasn't actually coming as a geochemist at that point, we should see, is there any chemical change that we can detect in these cores? Um, these, these cores, as you, you'll hear, they go back many hundreds of years, so we can look way back before the Europeans first uh, set foot on, on the Australian continent. And the basic principle is that uh, when, when you have a flood plume like this, uh, clays are, are washed out. This is, the, this is near the mouth of the Burdekin, actually. And the, um, the geochemistry has a unique feature. That is, as you are close to the river, the barium concentration in particular is quite high, um, and it declines along a linear line almost. This is called conservative mixing, and barium has a chemistry almost identical to calcium. So it is incorporated in the skeleton, and we therefore have a proxy of, of the amount of sediment being delivered um, that is recorded in, in coral skeletons. And just to test this, this shows on the bottom, shows the, the discharge from the, um, from the Burdekin River in the, in the black. And there's two different uh, reefs that, are, that we, have, we got these records come from. One is Havana Reef and the other is Pandora. The, the, and this shows just a short period of the flood events. 
and you can see that these two reefs that actually see the same flood plume have almost identical uh, responses. And the initiation of these events is coincident with, with, with the, um, the flood hydrograph actually delayed by one or two weeks because the flood plume does take a little while to move from the river mouth across, across to these reefs. And actually, it has an interesting phenomena as well, which I'll talk a bit later on, is that it has a long tail. You see the 74 flood, actually the effect of it almost is there for a whole year on the reef. So one argument had been previously, oh look, don't worry about these floods, they're very short-lived events, they bring a little bit of sediment and they're a natural thing anyway, so we just, you know, don't pay any attention to it. <clears throat> um, but that's not the, I'll show you now that you know, things have changed dramatically and we were always concerned actually that this tail may, was this a, re a real phenomenon or was it part of the way that coral incorporated the signal? And I'll show you later, I now believe this is a direct reflection of what's happening in the actual water column as well. So you can see there's, there's quite good agreement and sometimes where there's uh, double events you can sometimes pick them out um, and when there's periods of drought they're very, very obvious. So we took very long calls and went back, looked through the record and the very first striking thing we, we noted was that around about 1850, this is, the, this is from the uh, Burdekin River, the Havana record that we published some time back that you can see there's a dramatic change. This is the, the events, this is in more detail. You can pick up these events by event. So um, in about 1870, we had the very first major flood that, which occurred about five years after the initial settlement. And there's a major change in the barium uh, signal which we attribute to a much larger increase in the barium flux. And if you compare it you know, prior to European settlement, and you notice there were some events um, that's probably associated with droughts. Um, compare that signal before and after, there's a factor of five to ten times increase in, in, in the signal, which we attribute to a five to ten times increase in sediment being delivered to the reef. And here I'll just differ with Terry on a minor point. Um, we can actually pick on this record when James Cook sailed up the reef, and of course he's uh, he actually had the first encounter, at least from a European viewpoint, because his ship, of course, was um, holed by, as he was sailing up the reef. And we can then, and actually I showed this at the Royal Society, and they said, well, of course you should remember that we also funded the James Cook expedition. It was actually a Royal Society funded. So that's, I would have, maybe we'll just change the, so this wasn't done with the same science. Well, actually, he'd, I think, that in fact, it was done with a lot of science, because Banks was on this cruise as well. Um, so, but by accident, they uh, engaged with the Great Barrier Reef. <laughs> but there's some interesting things following. I won't have time to talk about them because he didn't actually beach his boat immediately. He kept sailing as if he knew about where the ports were. Um, and this is just a bit about the history of the catchment usage. And you can see that um, actually the Europeans, when they first started to settle these catchments, brought in sheep. They were quickly killed off by the spear grass. And so their numbers declined, but then the cattle numbers started to grow uh, quite substantially. Um, and, and I'll show you that's been a major impact. And how we know this, this is now the same record, but looking at finer scale. And you can see some very remarkable correlations between the cattle numbers, which are shown on the right, and the, um, and, and the, <clears throat> the flood and, and the flood intensity or the sediment delivery into the reef. And you can see that the very biggest peak actually in 1981, uh, which occurred after the peak in cattle numbers. It turns out if you look at, I'll show you later, but the 1981 event is not a large flood event, it's quite minor, but it followed a drought and it followed the fact that they'd overgrazed the catchments. And after that the, the farm or the cattle, the graziers got a little smarter and um, they've, they've since been a bit more realistic. You can see very close relationships between peaks in cattle numbers and following those peaks, the the extra sediment that's gone out. Um, we've now so that work I showed you was the Burdekin River, uh, Havana. We've now continued this work um, just to check that we're getting the same story up and down the reef. Now, this is actually Fitzroy Island, which is the record, which is just south of Cairns, and this looks at a different river system, the Russell, Russell Mulgrave River. Terry showed a sawfish from the Mulgrave River. And you see exactly the same pattern. <clears throat> the red one is the one I showed you from the, from the Havana Reef. This is from the 
uh, from Fitzroy Island. You can see exactly from about the time the settlement started that the increase of these individual flood events. And actually, we can look at finer scale. You see these records are actually have weekly resolution, and you can pick out um, very similar features. Here's a period of drought in the 1960s with the same individual, it's the 68 flood. And you can see, of course, that you know, the peaks correlate. The magnitude shows a slightly differing responses of those two catchments, and that's not surprising because the Russell Mul Mulgrave is, is, a much, is a much more wetter catchment. Um, for example, a lot more sugarcane um, in, in the um, base of it. <clears throat> Magnetic Island, this is close to Townsville. It's actually um, been described by some people as a, um, a less impacted reef site, but actually it has about three times the signal as the uh, Burdekin. But of course, actually it turns out this record is affected by the very local um, magnetic island. has got enough of a, a small river that actually goes straight onto the local reef. This is about 100 metres offshore. Um, that makes, makes it quite dramatic. But nevertheless, you see the same pattern of from um, when the Europeans came, the massive change in the signal intensity, uh, demonstrating major changes in land use. This is from the Great Keppel Islands. In this case, the effect isn't quite so dramatic. This coral probably isn't quite in the right location. This catchment was definitely settled a little bit earlier, but again, we see the major change in, in behaviour. So these, these show that um, there has been a significant change in, in the way the rivers have been delivering sediment into the Great Barrier Reef. In fact, the rivers weren't orange coloured. Those flood plumes, if you came there before European settlement, they would have been clear river discharges in, into the into the Great Barrier Reef Lagoon. In fact, they were described by the very first settlers who actually, or explorers, not settlers, explorers, who actually described some of the rivers as they crossed them. And they don't, you know, they, they were basically surrounded by a, a natural habitat with not only mangroves, but the catchments were grassed and so on. And, and they weren't discharging large amounts of sediment. This actually shows where we have to get to. So we have now a natural baseline here shown in green. So this is the pre-European, this is the on, the, on the bottom axis is the flow of the Burdekin River, this is done for the Burdekin only, and this axis here you can read a sediment discharge into the reef. So we're now along this curve still, and after droughts, of course, in 1981, which I referred to, the, in fact you're way off the saline, there's a far, there's no factor of um, two to three times additional sediment following, obviously, a major drought event, i.e. the drought breaking flood. So the flood that follows that drought usually carries a very large amount of sediment. So we have a target, and this is the sort of thing we're building up now for all the different catchments, and we have quite a ways to go. Um, I'll show you that this isn't unique to Australia. So we've also done a study um, off Eastern Africa with the Stanford group, Rob Dunbar's group, and they have this cause close to um, the river that, that shows similar effects. So we thought we'd have a look at it. And this is actually a historical photograph of a little niche of a gully taken in the 1950s down here. And this is actually the same picture. You have to find the tree, actually. The tree, it's actually up here somewhere, right? It's hard to follow, but there's been tremendous erosion in the catchments. These are volcanic soils that are easily eroded. Um, and when we compare the signals, we find um, a similar kind of phenomenon. In this case, there's no... the um, they're sometimes out of phase because you're on the other side of the Indian Ocean, i.e. wet periods often follow when we have drought periods. But we saw, we we're seeing the same signals. And interestingly, um, the business of the tails is resolved here in that this shows a blow up of the 74 event, which I showed you here, which lasted a year. But in, the, in this system, because the flood plumes move in the opposite direction, they move away from the coral very quickly. And we find that after major flood events, the signal drops almost back to baseline. So there's no doubt then that our tail is a real phenomenon. And also, it turns out, if you look at the scales, um, the signals are much larger in this reef off Kenya. So they're actually getting about a factor of not 5 to 10, but 20 to 30 times increase over their baseline. So this is a problem, not only for the barrier reef, um, but for other catchment. This compares the two again over the long time scales. You see that um, there were maybe um, some use of the catchment in, in Kenya in, in as far back as the 1820s, but the major impact was from 1920s through to the present. And the reasons for this are clear because the population of Kenya has been growing quite rapidly. Actually, I've got my red line here. Australia 
uh, this red line should be, they actually started off a similar population, about 15 million in the mid-70s. Kenya now has over 35 million. We're not expected to get to 35 million until about 2030, I think, is one projection. But there's, in, and the other difference is in Kenya that there's a large populations in the interior in the catchments who utilise this land in contrast to, to, to Australia. So I'll just finish off now. Um, I've now moved to WA, so um, I'm going to do a brief comparison. We've, we've, we, Great Barrier Reef has many issues. The flood plumes I've discussed, uh, bleaching, which is shown here, there's industrialisation along the coast, crown of thorns, uh, and of course bleaching, which you will hear about. In WA, we're actually in a different... It's a desert area. There is the interaction between the, the, um, the land and the ocean. Although these are fringing reefs within 500 metres of the land, they seem to be in excellent condition still. This is an igloo reef. These are pictures I took snorkelling within a metre of the surface. And um, the reefs look in good shape. And then we have some reefs in temperate areas um, as well. So I'll just leave it at that point. So obviously the story is we have to enhance the resilience of corals at the local level, improve catchment management, and obviously we'll still have this inevitable issue of climate change. Thank you very much.